that's the highest in 24 months. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics revealed that the figure is 0.08% higher than the rate of 12.26% uh, recorded in March 2020 and the highest rate since April 2018. On a month-on-month -month basis, the index increased by 1.02% in April 2020, a 0.18% rate higher than 0.84% recorded in the previous month. The composite uh, food index increased by 15.03% in April 2020, 0.03% points compared to 14.93% recorded in March 2020. According to the report, the rise in the food index was caused by increases in prices of potatoes, yam and other tubers, fish, oil and fats, meat, fruits, bread and cereals, and of course, vegetables. Let's turn to our business performance manager, VFD Group, or Lukule Salami. He joins us via Skype from Lagos Island for more on this discussion. Let's start with this, uh, uh, Mr. Salami. Inflation is out, and all parameters seem to be on the high side. Uh, what, how does this come to you? Were you expecting this? Um, thank you um, for having me on the show today. Um, it's not surprising what we have going on in terms of the inflation. And like you um, earlier mentioned, the major index for the inflation that's been pushing this up is um, on the food prices. Um, so even prior to um, the old coronavirus lockdown, um, if you notice the trend towards the end of the um, year, between August to December 2019, we had a steady increase in the inflation um, index um, for the country, largely because of um, food prices inching up um, from, um, from the border closure. Now, between the border closure and the gap this has created in um, the food price uh, markets, um, then we also add um, the coronavirus layer on that. Nothing prepared us for this. And um, also with this, we had the lockdown, which actually reduced movement to an extent. And um, even on the, on the retail bit of it, you could start seeing how this has um, trickled down. Um, you and I will probably step into the market in various places, and things we probably buy for X um, has gone up by Y. So it's totally expected, um, and it's something we need to look forward to um, how to manage um, this in the coming months. Indeed, very worrisome. Uh, the Minister of Finance also came out to say uh, after the meeting yesterday with the Vice President, Ministers and Governors in uh, attendance talking about what we should expect that we are gradually moving into recession and the figures are not looking very good at all. But what do you make of this? Um, so again, not surprising. And um, if you look at, um, if you've been following reports around the world, so recently the um, Organization of Economic um, Countries um, recently said that they expect the world um, growth should decline by um, about 1.5%. So the initial projection for GDP growth across the world was about 3% um, for the year. Uh, uh, this has been cut back to about 1.5%. And Nigeria is not in, um, uh, is not in any way uh, um, immune or isolated to what has been going on around the world. Um, we need to actually manage our finances better. A chunk of our revenue um, is from um, crude oil. And we've also seen that this has taken a beating um, in the global stage. Unfortunately for the economy we have, is an economy largely driven by commodity and also um, things that happen outside of um, the country. So to the extent that which commodity prices keep thanking um, from, a um, from a demand side um, problem, and also the events that are happening in terms of the global um, trade um, warfare between the um, U.S. and China, we definitely will take a beating on this. Um, so it's not uh, unexpected that um, we expect the economy to shrink. Um, how we manage it is what is most important. So from the government perspective, what are the palliatives and the measures they will put in place to um, reduce the impact of this? And also from um, corporate perspective, companies, individuals, we need to start positioning ourselves for the change that is to come. Managing this, like you just mentioned, it's not going to be very, very easy. What do you think? Are there any quick wins at all in all of this? Oh, yeah. Um, so, like we've seen the government roll out um, in the last couple of weeks, um, there were moratoriums for um, some facilities um, to industries that are affected. Um, we've also seen the raise of over 50 billion funding for the SME um, um, sector. Um, so there are a few things that will probably come up. Um, we'll probably see palliatives that trickle down um, to people and palliatives that are probably focused on um, companies. Um, because at the end of the day, it's a value chain. So um, 
companies need to perform and need to earn um, to ensure that they're able to keep workforce. And um, if they keep workforce, it also flows down to households and um, families can actually keep um, their earnings. So government will still need to keep expanding capacity and um, in terms of fiscal um, capacity um, to make sure the economy um, does not shut down. Um, we've seen a couple of questions around how government is going to fund um, this, um, considering the fact that crude oil prices seem to have tanked and um, there is no end in, um, in sight for this, at least for this year. So how do we manage the finances that has to come? I mean, there are considerations of government taking short-term funding and also um, expanding government debt um, through the IMF and other um, international bodies. But yes, we expect a um, rollout of palliatives from the government in terms of easing um, how this affects citizens. Indeed, a lot. The government really has a lot to deal with at this time. Very quickly, let's touch on the MPC uh, meeting, which has been postponed, Mount, obviously, because of the Ramadan, the Eid of Fitri uh, celebration. Now, do you expect uh, anything, any miracle? What do you expect? What are the decisions? What do you think would be done? Any shift in any of the sensitive parameters uh, the coming MPC meeting that would now hold on Thursday, would now hold for just one day instead of two days. Okay, um, so on that, I would not want to preempt what the committee um, will probably come up um, with. But I think, um, and again, if you look at the trend for a while now, um, the market reaction to the MPC um, outcome has not always been as drastic as it has been before. Um, this, uh, there could be several reasons for this. It could be a departure um, of the market's uh, realities from whatever um, MPC outcome um, is. But I think most importantly, beyond it goes beyond MPC and what, the, um, what is done in MPC. I think to a larger extent, um, a fiscal um, policy measure from the government to uh, actually... Uh, impact in how to ensure that the economy um, does not go into a full lockdown. So yes, the MPC will come out with its own, but to an extent, uh, you start seeing that a bit from um, liquidity flow within the financial sector, and um, that will probably also trickle down to companies. So whatever MPC comes up with, whether moving the rates or keeping the rates, um, in terms of CR, we also expect that um, to a large extent, they will try not to uh, make the um, cash flow available to um, the banks a bit worse. So, I mean, CR would be nice to keep consistent. At the same time, we've heard about LDR and our government has been trying to enforce this to a large extent. Now, um, it's also an important part that we need to find a way to balance um, how do we ensure banks are incentivized to give facilities to, um, to customers. But at the same period, this is a period where um, the risk of um, credit losses also is um, very prevalent. So it's just finding the right balance. So beyond, it goes beyond MPC. Um, the MPC will come out, will access, um, will assess um, what the um, government's policies um, or government decision around this would be, but it would definitely go beyond um, MPC decision to move this. All right, Mr. Salami, let's take this report. Uh, the Nigerian government has been roundly criticized over our country's rising debt portfolio. Its defense remains that the loans are for developmental projects through economic, though economic watchers feel the borrowings are necessary, the advice, caution, and more prudent management of resources. Lara Fulani, my colleague, takes it from here. Okay. 5 trillion naira to fund its 2020 budget. But the plans changed with COVID-19 biting hard on crude oil earnings. Subsequent plans showed new borrowing intentions of $6.9 billion from development finance institutions. A $3.4 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund has already been granted. Some economic watchers worry that these new loans would push up existing debt portfolio to over 30 trillion naira. But the authorities see nothing wrong in borrowing to fund developmental projects. What is key is not how much money or when you're borrowing the money. In fact, it's even, uh, it's even advisable to borrow money to inject more funds when you're in recession. And technically we are, or we're going to you know, get into one because the whole world is in recession. So the only way you're able to probably is to spend your way, you know, out of trouble. So okay. what is key is what are you doing with the monies you're borrowing? And if you're credit worthy in this time, then it's kudos for the country. Looted funds valued at $311 million were recently repatriated to the country. They are to augment funding for infrastructure projects. This analyst feels these monies are not significant enough to prevent borrowing. Um, granted that when this thing comes, it may enter into our foreign reserve. It may enter there. Nigerians may not know 
where it is being utilized. But I, I imagine that it, they will just put it in the foreign reserve or use it to do one particular project or the other. Um, many times, it may not be known to all Nigerians what the money is used for, but as far as I'm concerned, it cannot fill the gap of the deficit. The Debt Management Office is concerned impact of COVID-19 may affect the country's ability to service its debt well. Suggested ways the country could cut down on loans now include controlled spending and new strategies of fighting corruption. What you need to do is to make certain that whatever debts you're injecting, whatever capital you're injecting, is a generating revenue and is creating jobs. Okay, the moment you put your money into what can create jobs, and there's a lot that can create jobs in this season. Okay, we actually have a, a, an opportunity of creating jobs if we do the right things, if we're able to put in the money into the right places. We need to look at our expenditure area and reduce cost of governance. Cost of governance from executive, cost of governance from legislature, cost of go governance from um, even the lower uh, levels of government. Nigeria's revenue generation has been badly hit by the coronavirus pandemic. And one of the ways the authorities are trying to mitigate the impact of this on the economy is through borrowing. And though experts agree that borrowing may be totally unavoidable at this time, they however feel the amount being borrowed could be reduced with improved fiscal prudence. Lara Folayo, TVC News, Abuja. Now, I still have Mr. Salami is still standing via Skype. I'm sure you listened clearly to that report and you saw what analysts, their views there. Now, the issue about borrowing has been on the front burner and there's always this argument that there's a threshold that we're yet to get to. Now, what do you think basically about our debt profile? Okay, um, so for the debt profile, um, there's also, um, like you said, there's the threshold. So typically you're looking at something under 60%. Um, of um, debt to GDP, um, GDP ratio, which has always been the argument um, of the finance ministers over the years that, oh, we are still well under um, that ratio. When in reality, it goes beyond debt um, to GDP ratio. The cost of servicing this debt um, relative to the revenue um, earned by the government is probably as important um, as the debt to GDP, um, GDP ratio. Now, as of last year, we had about 56% um, loan servicing vis-a-vis -vis revenue. So it means for every 100 um, naira that is generated by the Nigerian government, 56 naira of it was used to service um, debts. Now, the question, next question is, if we do um, add additional debt um, as it is, uh, which looks inevitable, how do we want to service these debts? Considering the fact that debt is going to go up and revenue would also shrink. So yeah, um, it's the right balance we need to look for. It's rather sad also that on the on, on the end right now, um, a lot of the debts that will probably incur in the next um, couple of months uh, would likely not uh, be to revenue generating activities, which has also been the concern of some of the analysts um, you mentioned there. So if we take debts, let it go into infrastructure or into activities that will plow back um, revenues to the government. Unfortunately, these are dire times. So we need to actually um, take a bit of debts. We need to expand ICU capacity, laboratories, testing, information management, so or manage the whole COVID-19 um, 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 pandemic. So um, the question for government is how um, two things is prudent, uh, being prudent with um, the spending and also being accountable. So accountability is something that needs to come on board. But for um, our debt ratio, um, our debt profile, um, not particularly worrying. I think what is more worrying is the revenue um, earnings of the government. So if we can diversify revenue uh, and we're able to service debt or plow back debt into um, activities that will generate revenue, then yes, we can make it work. Before I let you go, what role does technology play in all of this, in helping us get out of all of these challenges? We've started with issues around expecting to get into recession, issues around the economy, issues around debt. Now, Many say technology can play a role in helping us address some of these challenges. Yeah, so um, for me, and um, from the perspective where I sit, there are two critical things um, that would actually help people um, in these times. It's innovation and it's technology. And um, while innovation can include technology, um, it's not limited to technology. So but let me just quickly discuss around technology. So around the world, we've seen um, many first. So first, um, parliament meeting via Skype, via Zoom, by a different medium that has been going on. These are things that s would have been unprecedented or probably people would have thought, oh, not possible. Um, also, and it's rather sad because it has, cost, um, it has come at it like significant human costs. Um, so I was discussing with someone recently and said that um, 
finally, we needed a pandemic was what forced um, the world to innovate and to become a bit more technology um, aware. Um, so the world is generally evolving. So technology now is going to be at the forefront of a lot of things. So and this pandemic has demystified the fact that you need to be in physical presence to work or to conduct activities. And I can break it down. Um, so bringing it back to the field in which um, I am currently operating. Um, so let me take um, financial services um, in the country today. So a lot of banks will probably be forced to innovate. And I emphasis on the word forced because this has come. And um, the banks are typically set up in a structure of brick and mortar. People need to come into buildings. People need to uh, physically be present to actually have um, everything going on. Now, it's a first cycle. However, I will take a position that v, um, VFD have take, uh, has taken, which is why I work. We were prepared for this. And not because we're expecting a pandemic would come, but we had actually said that, you know what, the future of banking goes beyond brick and mortar. So we decided to come up with a fully digitized banking offering. And we said, you know what, instead of opening the um, branches, odd branches here and there around the country and layering it with um, staff um, costs, assets, uh, and um, all the other costs, some costs involved in setting up locations, we would run a digital offering, which is everyone can have access to a banking account without leaving the convenience of your home. So, I mean, and again, um, rolling it back, we had been, uh, we started working from home like a week before the government's official um, lockdown. We are able to do this because we are prepared for this also. Again, there's a proper business uh, management uh, process in place that ensures that even if fiscal locations are not accessible, we can continue to work. So we have systems, um, we have processes set up that ensures that we can service our customers and we can provide um, unlimited service um, to people. And we can also even bring up issue resolution and close out um, key transactions from the comfort of our um, homes. Indeed, very interesting, well thought out plan there. Business uh, Performance Manager of VFD Group. Thank you very much, Olukule Salami. Thank you for your time on the show today. Hope to have you again subsequently. Thank you.